Well, guys, welcome. What a, what a wonderful evening so far. Um, by the crowd and by the numbers, this is a high watermark in the life of our men's ministry. As you know, we were shooting for 300 last year with about 250 guys. Uh, we thought this year, man, let's shoot for 300. And we laid the gauntlet at your feet, and you have risen to the challenge. And uh, I think that's up to this moment, we have got 386 guys signed up. And a few more, yeah, a few more of us will be joining us tomorrow. And so we're delighted. Uh, thank you for fighting the traffic. It was an act of discipleship just to get here. And, and we're thankful for that. And uh, I know that across tonight and uh, tomorrow morning that God's going to use His Word to indeed speak into each of our lives. I hope you've come hungry. I know that indeed uh, there will be transformative truth set before you, and we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll have an ear to hear. As I said, delighted that Pastor Chris Mueller could join us and Harry Walls from the Master's University. In fact, Chris is here for, with us tonight. Chris, just stand. We want to say hello to you. We have an ongoing friendship with Chris in the church there in uh, Temecula, Faith Bible Church, and uh, we're delighted he is on the roster. Harry will be joining us also in the morning and then preaching for us on Sunday. I also believe we have a few guys from the Masters University that are part of a team. So why don't you guys stand and we'll just like to say hello to you. Welcome. Uh, there's a team down from the university doing some evangelism and ministry across the weekend. And uh, so we just pray that uh, we will indeed rise up as men. Um, these are evil days. These are days when manhood is being redefined and reassigned. And we want to hear from, from God, and I hope that you'll rise up to that challenge. I told you before about, about a, a deacon in our church in Toledo, Ohio, who told me one day, Pastor, uh, I was down in the city, and I saw a sign in the gun shop I thought you would be interested in. And he said, the sign said this, treat your gun like you'd treat an Irishman. Always assume it's loaded. <laughs> well, well, I am locked and I am loaded and I'm not going to waste any more time because there's so much I want to share with you as time allows. The message I want to speak on tonight is entitled Maximum Manhood. Maximum manhood, and we'll find that in the portrait and the pattern of Jesus Christ. My text for tonight is uh, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, and in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, you'll read these words, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That is some phrase. There is a world of theology there, the man, Christ Jesus. And in Christ, we have maximum manhood. We want to answer the question, whatever happened to manhood, we'll find an answer in Jesus Christ. So keep your Bible open and follow along. I like the story of the three guys who were talking in a backyard barbecue. Uh, two of them were talking about the, the amount of control they had over their wives. Uh, the other guy was kind of tight-lipped. And so after a while, the first two stopped talking. They turned to the third guy and they asked him what sort of control he had over his wife. To which he replied, well, if you want to know, the other night she came crawling to me on hands and knees. The guys looked at him and went, wow, tell us more. To which he said, while she was on her hands and knees, she told me to get out from under the bed and fight like a man. <laughs> Now, that's funny, but what's not so funny is the reality that men in general today are cowering under the bed, so to speak. They're frightened to embrace their God-given manliness and masculinity. A unisex society and a feminized church has emasculated and neutered men to a point of surrender and submission. Manliness is out. Have you noticed that? Patriarchy is under attack. 
Manhood and maleness is being redesigned and reassigned. Increasingly, men are being told to just stand down and shut up. You notice during the Kavanaugh hearings, the senator from Hawaii said just about as much as that, men need to shut up and do what they're told. A variety of cultural forces have forced masculinity into cultural retreat. In fact, C.S. Lewis warned us about this some time ago when he said this, we make men without chests and expect them to give virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. Guys, I'm here to tell you tonight that you and I are witnessing in our day and in our generation the cultural castration of men. In modern America, men are being made to feel guilty, being told to be quiet, being directed to get in touch with their feminine side, whatever that means. They're being labeled oppressors. They're being told that they've had their day to step aside because it's a new day and and, and women are going to take their place. In fact, as I thought about that, the crisis, because that's what it is, there were several things suggested themselves to me by way of contributing factors. So hang with me as we continue this extended introduction. What, what's contributing uh, to this um, lack of manliness and masculinity in the culture? Number one, what I call a fear factor. A fear factor. Simply put, men are being bullied out of their manhood. In a transgender culture, in the face of aggressive feminism, Men are being chickified. <laughs> it's acceptable and trendy to bash men. Manliness, masculinity. In fact, in recent years, Time magazine carried a cover story that displayed the body of a man and the head of a pig. The lead story was in the Valentine edition, and it was entitled, Men, Are They Really That Bad? Now, the underlying gist and thesis of the piece in Time Magazine was, yes, they are. Give them your heart and they'll break it in two. Give them your trust and they will abuse it. I like what Vody Bauckham says in a book on manhood. Today, young men are being taught to apologize for their masculinity. Women don't make as much money as men. Apologize. Women are are not as big and as strong as men. Apologize. Women do more household chores than men. Apologize. Women have to bear children. Apologize. Young men are so turned around on this issue that they've been even taught that women who make up 51% of the population are actually an oppressed minority group. I want you to get that last thought because it's very prevalent. Women are a minority. They're oppressed. They're hard done by. And I'm certainly not discounting the struggle that many women face and have faced. It's not the point I'm making. But the point I'm making is that uh, truth is being turned on its head. Facts are being twisted. Women are not a minority group in America. And they're not oppressed either. I just finished Tucker Carlson's book, Ship of Fools. He's a, an opinion uh, a commentator on Fox News. I enjoy his program. And in his book, Ship of Fools, there's a very interesting chapter where he deals with this kind of stuff. It's worth a read and it's worth buying. He said this, that men, not women, are struggling in America today. In 2018, more girls than boys will graduate from high school with higher grades. Since 1980, women have been more likely than men to go to college as well as stay there and graduate. Women live longer than men. Single women buy homes at more than twice the rate of single men. Women now constitute the majority of professional workers in the United States. The wage gap between men and women has shrunk to almost nothing. Men are killing themselves 
at a much higher rate than women. 77% of suicides in America are by men. If you're a middle-aged American man, you probably know at least one peer who has killed himself in the last couple of years. These are all facts I took from his book. And he goes on to say this, almost every university campus has a women's study department. You look far and wide to find a men's study department on any campus in America. But almost every university campus has a men's study department whose goal in many ways, if not in most cases, is to confront masculinity and disempower men. Rise up. Waking up, you're going to have to face the fear factor. But what Tucker Carlson shares is a turn up for the books. I thought it was women that needed help. Look at all the government initiatives directed towards women. But the reality is tonight, men are in trouble in the United States. Here's a second factor. A feminism factor, a fear factor, a feminism factor. Today there is a strain of feminism that has moved far and beyond the fight for equality of status and opportunity between men and women, which is a good thing. No arguments there. But modern feminism has moved far beyond that to a place where they want to erase gender distinction. They don't like gender clarity. In fact, uh, John Piper knocks the nail on the head. The tendency today is to stress the equality of men and women by minimizing the unique significance of maleness and femaleness. We've moved beyond equality. The stress today is on minimizing the distinctions. The argument goes something like this. Men and women are equal. In fact, men and women really are the same. In fact, taking that one logical step further, you can migrate between the sexes. You can be a man today and a woman tomorrow. That's why we've got transgenderism taking hold in the culture. That's why there is no mystery to the, or surprise to see alongside the rise of godless, aggressive feminism, the emergence of same-sex attraction and transgenderism. Gone is the biblical, traditional, historical idea that gender is something you are. In today's world, in modern America, gender is what you feel and what you decide. And it's an attack upon manliness and masculinity. And guys, do I need to tell you, you can imagine in this kind of world, there is little room for a declared, defined, and determined God-shaped masculinity. Men who believe in maleness as a noble, binding, binary category of humanity are public enemy number one. Stick your head up and declare that and see if it doesn't get shot off. And given that climate, increasingly there is little place or space in our society for institutions where boys are allowed to consciously be initiated into manhood. Manhood must be deconstructed, according to the modern feminist. That's why, by the way, girls are forcefully invading every institution and social group once preserved as a means for boys to become men. Exhibit A, the Boy Scouts of America. It started with gay scoutmasters redefining masculinity, and now you have girls in the Boy Scouts. Because, you see, our society will not allow islands to exist, that initiate boys into manhood. There's a fear factor. There's a feminism factor. Finally, there's a fatherlessness factor that I think is undermining manhood, masculinity, and manliness. 
This is an attack upon manhood by man. This is a black eye we've given ourselves. Because if you look across America, the absence of a father figure is in epidemic proportions. Today, America is suffering from an epidemic of fatherlessness. David Blankenhorn wrote a book a while ago on fatherlessness, and he says this, A generation ago, an American child could reasonably expect to grow up with his father. Today, an American child can reasonably expect not to. Fatherlessness is not approaching a rough parity with fatherhood as a defining feature of American childhood. The astonishing fact is reflected in many statistics, but here are the two most important. Tonight, about 40% of American children will go to sleep in homes in which their fathers do not live. Before they reach the age of 18, more than half of our nation's children are likely to spend at least a significant portion of their childhood living apart from their fathers. Never before in this country have so many children been voluntarily abandoned by their father. Never before have so many children grown up without knowing what it means to have a father. And when a boy doesn't have a father at home, he doesn't know what manhood is. And that's dangerous and destructive. It's tragic. It's a self-inflicted wound on men, by men. We should be ashamed of it if we've had any kind of party to it. Too many men forget that it only takes a moment to become a father, a lifetime to be one. But so many men are AWOL. Single parent homes are a plague on manhood. Now I want to pause because I know I can be very misunderstood here. And so I want to say, get it on the public record, my hat is off to every single mother struggling to raise a family. I apologize to every one of them who have been abandoned by cowardly men. But that said... History shows us and the Bible teaches us that a woman can never initiate a boy into manhood. In the best of circumstances, boys need fathers to become men. And almost half of our nation tonight go to bed in a home absent of their biological father. Study cultures, and you'll find uniformly prescribed paths to manhood, rites of passage, initiation ceremonies handed down from one generation of men to another generation of men, and we have short-circuited that as men in America. So, I think you'd have to agree with me, it's critical days in America for men. The fear factor, the feminism factor, the fatherlessness factor. Men are feeling. Men are confused. Men are afraid. This is a defining moment. That's why we put this conference together. Thank you for rising to the challenge and hearing the challenge. To borrow the words of Thomas Paine, around the time of our nation's revolution and fight for independence, these are the times that try men's souls. And so what I want to do in the balance of my time, I want to point you to the man, Christ Jesus. Because that's how our Lord Jesus is described in, in 1 Timothy 2 verse uh, 5. He's the man, Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus was every inch a man. He's maximum manhood. He's the trademark when it comes to manhood. He's the benchmark when it comes to masculinity. Jesus is the true man. He ought to be our aspiration as men. He ought to be our inspiration as men. He came in the form of a servant and in the likeness of man. Remember, he was paraded out by Pilate. A low derogatory, nevertheless, we take from it something beautiful. Behold the man. He's a man, every inch a man. And we should desire above everything else in this world to be like him tonight as man. 
I, I wrote a few things down. It's a sermon in itself. You can do your own thinking about it, but let this hit you with, with renewed freshness. Jesus created man. All things were made by him according to John 1. Jesus created man. Jesus came as a man. According to Philippians 2, 5 to 11, he added human nature to his eternal and divine nature. Although equal with God, he emptied himself, not by subtraction, but by addition, by adding human nature to himself so that he might, in submission to the Father and in an act of humility and in a demonstration of love, become obedient to the point of death on a cross. That's why Pilate says, and John records it, behold the man. Oh, it's the God man. Jesus created man. Jesus came as a man. Jesus lived as a man. I'll come back to that thought. Jesus died for a man, for men. And here's the thought we don't often think about, and Jesus is forever a man. He was resurrected physically. Jesus is a man forever. He is the maximum man. He defines, declares everything that you and I ought to think about man. And he lived as a man. He showed us how to live as men. I know it's strange sounding. It almost borders on sacrilege. But Jesus went through puberty. He grew from boyhood to manhood. For a good part of his life, he was a working man, probably in the field of carpentry. He discovered his masculinity, identity, and destiny as a man. He discovered, demonstrated, and defines manliness. Amen? Amen. He's the true man. He's maximum manhood. And God's purpose is that you and I would conform ourselves to the image of his dear son. You want a hero? You want a model? You want a trademark, a benchmark? It's Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus. Now, let me say something before we look at several things about him and wrap this up, which is quite a way from now. <laughs> Just in case you were reading too much into that statement. But, but here's something that's very important. To come back to this idea that he lived as a man. You and I need to realize that is a fact. He lived, although God, in human form as a man. You can go to John 5, 19, John 5, 30, John 6, 38, and John 8, 28, and you will read that he did nothing of himself. He didn't exercise his own will. He conformed his life. His will to the will of the Father that sent him. And I think it's so important that you and I grasp that he did nothing of himself. Although his human nature was wedded to his divine nature without confusion or dilution, you and I need to understand that throughout his life, Jesus did not draw upon his deity to live his life. Because you and I often think, when we think of him, that in a sense Jesus cheated a little. When he faced trials, when he faced temptations, when he faced tasks, let's not forget he was God, which is true. But he lived as a man, although God. Don't forget he suspended the independent use of his divine prerogative. That's what our theology teaches in the kenosis of Philippians 2 verses 5 to 11. He didn't draw upon his daddy. He lived in humble submission to the Father. He learned obedience through suffering. He grew in wisdom and favor with God and man. He found direction and instruction through Scripture. He found grace and guidance through prayer. And he found strength and power through the Holy Spirit. He's every bit our example. He lived as a man among men. His obedience was real, and it's a pattern for us. 
if I can put it that way, he didn't cheat. He lived the life you and I are living apart from sin. And he did it in submission and surrender to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And so I've been asking my, myself this question, what would Jesus do? Very famous question. What does manliness look like? Let, and, 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 you know, there's no end to this. And someday this may be the beginning of a series, but I, I'm going to throw some things your way, and as time allows me, we'll cover them. But I want you to think about manliness and masculinity from a Jesus perspective. And here's the first thing I want you to write down. Write, reflect, meditate. I want you to think about with me, Jesus the common man. Jesus the common man. Jesus' model of manhood for us must first take us to this idea that he lived the balance of his life in obscurity surrounded by the ordinary. We're going to go somewhere with this. But before we get to the Jesus of the miracles and the I am statements, Jesus who broke the back of death, I want you to just camp on the idea that Jesus lived the balance of his life in obscurity surrounded by the ordinary, and it defined his manliness. For most of his life on earth, Jesus was not a miracle worker. Rather, he was the obedient son of Mary and Joseph. He was a good neighbor to those on his street and in his village. He was a good brother to his sisters. He was a faithful friend to his brothers. When's the last time you thought out the family life of the Lord Jesus? Because he lived there in that context for some 30 years. So if we're looking at Jesus, the man, imagine him in the carpenter's shop. Imagine him in the grocery store. Imagine him helping his neighbor. Imagine him helping his sister with homework. Because it's all true. It seems to be a, a, a justified deduction and implication of the fact that for 30 years, Jesus lived in submission to Mary and Joseph. We don't get much of his life after his virgin birth. Luke opens the door just a little bit. When at age 12, you know, he gets left behind in Jerusalem. He gets into theological debate with some of the smartest brains in Jerusalem. He ties them all up in knots. His mom and dad come back and find him. They're a little ticked off at the whole thing. And he says, don't you know, I must be about what? My father's business. But, but the text says he went home with them and subjected himself to them. That's manliness. That's a challenge. And the point I want to take from it, apply it and move on, is this, that Jesus' manhood was defined by bread and butter issues in life. The day-to-day -day stuff that we tend to downgrade and feel guilty about Write it down. Think about it. It'll be an encouragement to you. It'll add luster to your everyday existence. Jesus elevates the ordinary. Jesus dignifies the daily. Jesus embraced the daily grind. And you and I ought to, too. What about 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11 to 12? I love it, where Paul says to the Thessalonians, hey, I love your prophetic charts and all your eschatological expectation, but hold on a minute. Let's get back down to earth. Why don't you live a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your hands? See, as a pastor, I'm always concerned about the supersizing of the Christian life. Oh, let's move some mountains for God. Let's win the world to Jesus. Why don't you paint your neighbor's fence and take the trash out while you're at it? Help your wife in the kitchen. Change your kid's diaper. Change your son how to change, uh, fix a flat tire. Because Jesus dignifies the ordinary. 
He embraces the daily grind. Jesus, the common man. You know, I had to remind my own father of this. He's 84. Blue-collar man, factory worker. He's lived in the same house for 50 years, about 1,500 square feet. Hasn't gone far. In his eyes, he hasn't done much, perhaps, because, you see, he's reading stuff and he's hearing stuff about supersizing the Christian life. He was sharing, he's been looking over his life as... There's regrets there. Has he done enough? Well, he wasn't a faultless or flawless man, that's for sure. But I can tell you, as his son with my sister and my brother, we have lacked for nothing because William de Courcy dignified the ordinary. He went to the factory when he didn't want to go. He would like another job, but there wasn't that many jobs, so he stuck at the one he had. He's been in the same church for 50 years. He's been a deacon for 35. He's opened and closed doors for that amount of time. His children love the Lord. His son's a pastor. Hey, Dad, that's a pretty good resume. You're the common man, just like your Savior. Embrace it. Embrace it. We've got to be careful. Mike, Michael Horton talks about that in his, his book, Ordinary. Talks about how we're using these words like radical, epic, ultimate, extreme, awesome, on the edge, the next big thing, explosive breakthroughs. You only have to turn TBN on. That's what you'll get all night long. But, but he addresses this and he says this. Ordinary has to be the one loneliest world word in our vocabulary. Who wants a bumper sticker that announces to the neighborhood, my child is an ordinary student at Bubbling Brook Elementary? <laughs> who wants to be that ordinary person who lives in an ordinary town, is a member of an ordinary church, has ordinary friends, and works an ordinary job? Our life has to count, does it not? We have to leave our mark, have a legacy, make a difference. And all of this should be something that can be managed, measured, and maintained. We have to live up to our Facebook profile. It's one of those newer versions of salvation by works. And then he says this, still I sense a growing restlessness with the restlessness. He's right. Guys, if we are trying to find maximum manhood, you find it in Jesus the common man. Embrace your ordinary life and dignify it with gospel intentionality. Number two, Jesus the competent man. Jesus the competent man. The biblical text alerts us to the fact that Jesus didn't waste those silent years. I alluded to the fact that the biblical text is silent about many years of Jesus' life. He emerges probably around the age of 30. His public ministry lasts for about three and a half years. But during those years, according to Dr. Luke, Jesus developed on every front into a mature, competent man. Can I go back to that passage that I mentioned in Luke chapter 2 where Luke apart from Matthew, Mark, and John, gives us a little window into those silent years when Jesus emerges at the age of 12, sensing God's call on his life. But, but I want you to notice that after that incident where Mary and Joseph give him a little bit of a telling off and they, and, and they kind of grab him to some degree by the scruff of his collar and take him out of the temple... Here's what we read in verse 51 of Luke 2. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Subject to the common life. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. There comes a point in Jesus' life where he puts away childish things and becomes a man. The Lord Jesus became a responsible adult. 
He, he increasingly took ownership of his own life. He was not a burden to his family or community, but a blessing. Look at the text. He grew physically. He was strong and healthy. He grew intellectually. He was biblical and worldly wise. He grew socially in favor with man. He was good company. He grew spiritually. He was a lover of the divine and the sacred. Is that you increasingly? If you're 12, 13, 14, 15, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, are you growing physically, intellectually, socially, spiritually? Are you taking care of your body? Are you biblical and worldly wise? Are you good company and socially well adjusted? Are you a lover of the sacred? Are you growing into competency as a man? Are you still needing burped and cuddled? What's the point? Jesus grew up and became a man. I know that's a simple statement. It's a matter of factly statement, but it's a glorious statement. What does manliness look like? It embraces the common. It dignifies the ordinary. And I'll tell you what, it strives towards competency. Jesus emerges into public life, age 30, or thereabout, mature, competent, and ready to do his heavenly Father's business. I've got a maxim for you, and I want you all to think about it, and especially young men here tonight. Growing old is a given. Growing up is a choice. And Jesus is a model for that. God speaking. That was, a, that was a name man from heaven. <laughs> if I hear one complaint as a pastor about young men today, it is this. I hear it from girls. I hear it from parents. They need to grow up. They need to mature emotionally. They need to grow in practical wisdom. They need to take ownership of their lives. They need to stop being gamers in life because life is not a game. They need to move beyond adolescence. They need to get a job, any job. I didn't say go to school. I said get a job. Maybe you need to go to school to get a, a better job, but you can take any job until you can get a better job. Get a job. They need to move out of the basement of the home. They need to own their own place. They need to stop watching Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> and they need to stop trying to be Peter Pan, who never wanted to grow up. Jesus puts an end to the idea of perpetual adolescence. He didn't stay there. And he grew in stature and wisdom, and favor with God and man. My friend Steve Davey, in his commentary on Titus, notes a, a, a 10-year study that was done in Europe and, and the United States called The Death of the Growing Up. And, and this 10-year study discovered certain things for example, in Great Britain, 46% of adult couples regard their parents' houses as their real homes. In Italy, nearly one out of three 30-year-olds never leave their parents' homes to begin with. One case in Italy involved a young man who successfully sued to make his father responsible to give him financial assistance. Line him up and shoot him. That's what I say. <laughs> Not really. Now, now here, here's what Steve Davey goes on to say, not, not just because he was unemployed, but because he couldn't find a job that he wanted. He owned his own apartment, lived, didn't live at home, and was in his 30s. In America, the majority of 18 to 49-year-old males watched the Cartoon Network more than they watched CNN. I'm not sure that's a bad thing, but, <laughs> but you get the point. You, you, you get the point. <laughs> Listen to this. The average video gamester in the 1990s was 18. Today he's 30 or older. 
That's shocking. There, there's more stats here. I think you get, get the point. Imagine a 34-year-old man still thinking and living like a middle, e- middle schooler. In fact, one journalist said this. I thought this was rather good. Just look around. We are surrounded by grown-ups who haven't left childhood. With people in their 40s and 50s, you can't find any clear demarcation of what's for parents and what's for the kids. Men in particular now dress like their sons, from message emblazoned t-shirts to chunky athletic shoes, both equally at ease in the baggy rumple of perpetual summer camp. That's the world in which we live. But Jesus challenges that. He's not only a common man, he's a competent man. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read J.C. Ryle and the English Reformers. And read about Bishop Hugh Latimer and Bishop Ridley. Read about how they were marched out by Queen Mary to be martyred as Protestants. And as they're tied back to back and the flames start to lick around their feet, Hugh Latimer famously says to young Ridley, Master Ridley, be of good comfort and play the man. For perhaps today God will light a candle in England that will not be put out. Maybe our deaths will start a fire in the church and a blaze in the country. Master Ridley, be of good comfort and play the man. Our Lord Jesus played the man, a common man, a a competent man. I'm going to just throw this your way. I don't have time to develop this because I want to get the other stuff, be, be, you know, aware of our time. Just put down Jesus the connected man. Jesus the connected man. Because he emerges into public life, he lives in community with other men. He develops sanctifying friendships. The bulk and balance of Jesus' earthly ministry was spent in the company of 12 men, one of them a traitor. And even among the 12, he had three special friends, James and John and Peter. And you'll find them with him at the most intimate moments. It was a bond of love between Christ and these men that is marked by John, the apostle of love, who says in John 13, verse 1, that he loved they his own until the end. The Greek word there is not end as in time, but end as in completion, perfection. He loved his own completely. He treasured those men. It hurt him when in the hour of his need, face first on Gethsemane, They couldn't watch with him for one hour. Oh, guys, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? You feel the pain, don't you? But Jesus models for us the fact that manliness is not marked by robust individualism. It's marked by community. It's marked by an acknowledgement that life is a team sport. Men are notorious loners. But as the park rangers know, lone rangers are dead rangers. Two is better than one, right? Ecclesiastes 4. And so I just encourage you, make sure you've got a circle of godly men who you can count as real friends in your life. We're not talking about acquaintances, golfing buddies, fans. We're talking about people who know you, people who put you first, who lovingly wound you when necessary, for fearful are the wounds of a friend, deceitful are the kisses of an enemy, who stick with you, and who make you a better friend of God. Do a study in the life of David and Jonathan or Jesus and his disciples and learn about the connected life. I like what uh, Thoreau wrote in Walden. Here's what he said. I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, and three for society. 
It's a good statement. Can I challenge you as we move on, each man here, invite a man to pull a seat up beside you and share life together. Jesus, the common man. Jesus, the competent man. Jesus, the connected man. Here's another thought. Jesus, the called man. From the age of 12 at least, Jesus had an awareness about his life's purpose. He had a sense of calling on his life. From his earliest recollections, he knew he must be about his father's business. Luke 2 verse 49. He was a man on a mission. What did he say to Zacchaeus in in Luke 19.10? I have come to seek and save the lost. He, He knew why he was here. He didn't make it up as he went along. He didn't get up in the morning in a fog regarding purpose and destiny. No. Jesus knew why he was here. He didn't meander his way through life. In fact, what does Luke tell us? Luke 9, 51, he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. You remember back in our study of Mark, how Jesus mentioned on three occasions and prophesied on three occasions that he must suffer, that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer at the hands of the elders. Mark 8, 31, Mark 9, 31, Mark 10, 33 to 34. Jesus' life was marked by a sense of destiny and calling. Every moment of his life was defined by a sense of calling. We talk about Mark's gospel. Have you ever done that little study in John's gospel and traced the word hour? And you'll find in his early ministry, in the middle of his ministry, speaking of his impending death and his substitution for sinners on the cross, Jesus will say, the hour has not yet come. And then when you get to John 17, on the eve of his crucifixion, what does Jesus say? Father, the hour has come, and I'm going to glorify you on the earth. Trace that study. It's John 2, 4, John 7, 6. John 12, 23, John 13, 1, John 17, 1 and 2. The point I don't want you to miss is every minute of Jesus' life was tied to that hour. He knew the goal of his life. He knew why he was here. Point. Application. Guys, here it is. His life was marked by determination and direction not distraction. Jesus' life was marked by determination and direction, not distraction. He went through life with his mind made up. I must go to Jerusalem. There was a purpose and a passion to all his days on earth. Can I put it this way? Jesus redeemed the time on the way to redeeming mankind. Jesus was a called man. And I want to apply that. Here's what I want to say to you. As men, not, let's not live life by accident. Let, let's not spend our days chasing our proverbial teal. Let's get up each and every day with a sense of clarity about God's will for us. Let's live on purpose. Let it be said of us that was said of David that he served his generation by the will of God. That's what you want to be said about you. You want that on your headstone. You want that in the obituary. You want your children to know that of you. He served his generation by the will of God. It wasn't about him. He didn't fritter his days away. He didn't spend his time and his talents and his treasures on that which didn't count. Let's not simply survive as men. Let's not swap the American dream for God's will. Let's not seek great comforts, but great causes. 
What about Ephesians 5, 15 to 17? Can I read it for you? Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of God is. We misunderstand this passage. This passage is not about efficiency. This passage isn't about time management per se, although that's somewhere there. No, in fact, the word time here, or the, sorry, the word days here is the word kairos. It speaks of opportune time, not chronological or linear time. We, we need to understand the time we're in. We're in, we're in evil days. In the preceding verses, men's lives are marked by the works of darkness, but we're the children of light. And so when we're told here to redeem the time and understand what the will of God is, that's the point. Redeeming the time is coming to understand what the will of God is for your life and then with energy and purpose and determination setting out to accomplish those things. That's what it means to redeem the time, to make the right choices about life, to pursue the call of God. You want to know what the will of God is? It's the will of God you be saved and spirit-filled. It's the will of God you pursue costly discipleship. It's the will of God you marry and raise a family. It's the will of God you work in a job. It's the will of God you love your neighbor. It's the will of God you evangelize. It's the will of God you discover what your natural and spiritual gifts are and bring them to bear upon the service of the church of Jesus Christ. That is the will of God. 90% of God's will is revealed. Don't worry about the 10%. If you get the 90% right, I think the 10% will take care of itself. You don't need to get up in a fog. Are you saved? And spirit fell. Because in fact, having talked about the will of God in the preceding verses being walk in the light, the subsequent verses are be filled with the spirit. Are you a spiritual man? Are you controlled by the spirit and by the word? Are you pursuing costly discipleship by taking up your cross each and every day? Are you pursuing Marriage, it's a good thing that a man should find a good wife and raising a family. Have you got a job? Are you taking ownership for your own life? Are you loving your neighbor? Are you evangelizing? Are you involved in the church? All those things have got to be true about you. That's your calling. That's your mission. That will keep you busy. And your life on track. I remember a man in the church here gave me this little poem a while ago. Some men die by shrapnel. And some men go down in flames. But most men die inch by inch playing silly little games. That's not the way the Lord Jesus lived. His life was on target. There's something I wanted to say beyond that, but I can't. So let's get to the last thought. Jesus, the controlled man. Jesus, the controlled man. As the Lord Jesus emerges from the silent years into public view, we see him anointed with the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit. Remember when we were in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 9 to 13, you have those two episodes where John baptizes the Lord Jesus, and while he's coming out of the water, the heavens part, God declares, this is my beloved Son, and we read, and the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. And then we read in verse 12, after that, after he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, we read, and immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Or to use Matthew's terms, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. So Jesus, at the very beginning of his public ministry, is anointed by the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit. 
In fact, that's not all. If you go to Luke chapter 4 and verse 14, after that incident, we read, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Following his wilderness temptation, he returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And what did he do? Well, according to Luke, he, he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And here's what we read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive, recovering sight to the blind, and set liberty to the oppressed and declare the year of the Lord. He was given the scroll of Isaiah, and he didn't go to Isaiah 53. He went to Isaiah 61 where we read about the Davidic Messiah when he comes. Indeed, the Spirit of God will be upon him. And he'll proclaim liberty to the captive and bring sight to the blind. What's the point? The point is this. From this point forward, everything Jesus says and does, he does through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why in John 5, verse 30. I quoted it earlier. He says, I do nothing of myself. He's God, fully God. He's the express image of God, the perfect representation of God. But he has suspended the independent use of his divine prerogatives. He has married human nature to his divine nature without confusion or corruption. And now he lives as a man in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, seeking to fulfill the will of the Father. Jesus is a controlled man. Each and every day he's under the control and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And it's so important that you and I grasp that. Because this vindicates what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 21. That we need to follow his example. But many times have we read that and we've said, I can't do that. And let's not forget he was God. This is impractical. This is impossible. No siree. Because we're following the man, Christ Jesus who lived in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to fulfill the will of God. And what Jesus did and what Jesus said, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the beauty is that the Lord Jesus has given us that same, self-same spirit for our journey of faith. Right? John 14, 16. It's expedient that I go away, I'll send the Comforter. The Holy Spirit, he'll be in you. He says to the disciples in Acts 1 verse 8, you know what? Stay in Jerusalem until you receive power from the Holy Spirit that you might be my witnesses. Well, my friend, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit from the risen Christ. And we can follow his example and we can fulfill our mission. We can take on his image. We can do his works. Because the same power that energized him energizes us. Oh, we need as men to submit to the Holy Spirit. As a young Christian, every Wednesday night at Rathkill Baptist Church in Belfast, alongside my father, I would hear two old women pray. These two women had seen actual revival in the early part of the 20th century in Northern Ireland under the ministry of J.P. Nick, W.P. Nicholson, and they never forgot those times of refreshing and power. And without feel, perhaps in a rather moat or rote fashion, they prayed every Wednesday night, Oh God, the need of the hour is Holy Ghost power. And that tattooed itself on me as a young Christian. They're right. My need is the power of the Holy Spirit. I've got work tomorrow. 
I'm going to go among a bunch of unbelievers that are going to tempt me and goad me. I'll be standing in the open air on Sunday preaching the gospel. I've got my Sunday school class on Sunday morning with the boys. How do I pull this off, Lord? I know my own sin and my weakness and my frailty and my humanity. Oh, God, the need of the hour is Holy Ghost power. And my theology reform reminded me I didn't need to ask for the Spirit of God. I'd already been given Him. I needed to give myself to Him. That was the key. I needed to surrender. And as we close, that's the challenge, isn't it? Let's admit it. Even in this room, too many men today are out of control. They're doing their own thing. They're writing their own story. They're not submissive to pastoral authority. They're not in the Word. They haven't been to the Bible study in a while or the accountability group in a month or two. They're out of control. They're doing their own thing. They're a law unto themselves. That's not manliness. Jesus was a controlled man. If I'm honest, I'm not sure the church is helping that emphasis of living the controlled life with books like Wild at Heart. Now, I want to be fair. I think I know what John Eldridge set out to do. He tried to confront passivity and lack of courage in man. Maybe I'm being picky, but I'm a little concerned by the word wild. Because there was nothing wild about the Lord Jesus. He was a man under control. He submitted to his parents. He walked in the power and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He only did those things that pleased the Father. There's nothing wild about that. He didn't follow his own passions or pleasures or desires. In fact, I think Richard Phillips in his book, Masculine Mandate, would remind us that the image of manhood is a garden, not a wilderness. Adam was set in a garden where he was to tend it and care for it under the authority of God. Again, I don't want to be too picky. I hope you understand that. But let's be careful of this idea of wild at heart. Let's think about Jesus' submission, submission, subjection, control. We need to be men filled by the Holy Spirit. I've told you before, but it's a good place to finish. The, the story of the evangelist D.L. Moody, invited to a city to preach the gospel. As the ministers meet and prepare, one young kind of upstart kind of puts his hand up and said, you know, well, let's talk about D.L. Moody. Was, was there no one else available? <laughs> I mean, listening to you old guys, you'd think that um, D.L. Moody has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. One old pastor stood up and he said, oh, no, son, if we've given you that impression, we've, we, we, we've certainly wronged you. D.L. Moody doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but the reason we're bringing him is because we believe the Holy Spirit's got a monopoly on D.L. Moody. <laughs> D.L. Moody was a surrendered man. We're to know what the will of God is, and according to Ephesians 5.18, the will of God is to be filled by the Spirit. Love it. D.L. Moody had him and the Holy Spirit had a monopoly of D.L. Moody. And may we live it. Let's pray. Father, we catch our breath, a lot of stuff, but glorious stuff, centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ, the man, Christ Jesus. Our Lord Jesus, we, we salute you as man. 
We marvel at your humility, your humiliation, your willingness to empty yourself of self-will, surrender to the Father, depend upon the Spirit, embrace a cross, and live a life of controlled passion and purpose. Lord, may we as men tonight maximize manhood as we find it on beautiful display in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for these thoughts. Help us to be common men. Help us indeed to be competent men, connected men, called men, and above all, controlled men. Help us to model masculinity. Help us to do it in a manner that would never frighten our wives, hurt our children. Pray we would do it in a way that would attract the world with all its mixed ideas. So help us to rise up, to meet the challenge of the hour, to redeem the time, and to know what the will of God is. And by God's grace and by the Spirit's power, do it. And every man said, Amen. Well, God-